Well, you've done your job well. And I can see that by looking around, see what a comfortable place we have to meet in. And uh, song service was beautiful. And so far, the fellowship uh, has been great. And uh, I thank God for you. And I thank you for your presence, for your support. And I ask you, not only uh, that you continue uh, to pray for me, that God will bless us for a few minutes while we stand before you, but that you will also, if indeed the Lord blesses me to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and demonstration of the Spirit, uh, that you will give me your undivided attention for just a little while, uh, for a short season. And I believe that, and I, and I, know, and I believe you know this, that if you do indeed give your undivided attention and your expectations are centered upon God and not me, nor even yourself, good things can come out of our coming together today. We can be lifted up once again into the mountaintops of the love of God and sit together in a heavenly place and enjoy sweet blessings from on high. It's been a long time since I was here at this place. And many, many thoughts run through my mind. Uh, uppermost in those thoughts are those concerning those that I have known here in years past that are no longer among us. They're passed on, as we say. And they've gone to a place that the Apostle Paul says is far better. Far better. The only place in the Scriptures that expression is used. Far better. And that's the place that we long to be. And sometimes when troubles get so great upon us, the desire to be there where it is far better swells up within us to the point that we'd like to just go on now and be there. But yet we realize that there is a purpose for us being here in this present time. There's a purpose for us in our lives. And I believe that that purpose for the children of God is centered around the Word of God, the truth of God, and the fellowship of the Lord's people. That's, that's where our life is as God's children. <clears throat> The reason I have not been here is not because I had no desire to be, but I've been hindered much in the past of being able to go some of the places that I would like to have gone. I have responsibilities now, not only at Chipley, but also in uh, Decatur County, Georgia, with uh, Prosperity Church on the second weekend, and Providence Church north of Sylvester uh, on the first and third weekend. And... <clears throat> And, and it's hard for me to uh, maintain a continued fellowship with those that I've known and loved in the past, including your pastor. Uh, when I was living permanently, more or less, in Chipley, staying there most of the time, Brother J.C. and I had some good times together. And we don't have those much anymore. Every once in a while we cross paths, like here recently, uh, when we shared the stand in, uh, at Little Vine Church. And it was a great joy to be there with him and preach together. And I hope to be there with him again if he's able to be there on the 13th of next month on Saturday when they ordain a deacon. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to be there together at that time. But it's good to be here. A lot has transpired in my life in the past few years since I've seen you, and I know that there have been changes in your life. 
Some of you have had changes perhaps in your life or things that take place that are uh, as drastic as those that have taken place uh, in mine. But I don't think very much more drastic. Five years ago, I had open heart surgery and the, my heart specialist told me uh, when he gave uh, did a catheter uh, prior to that, he gave me a catheter and, and I was expecting him to fix the problem while he was in there and put a stent in there. And when he finished up and I came to and, and, uh, and spoke with him, I asked him if he did that. He said, no. He said, that won't work. He said, your mitral valve is, is broken. It's split. It's torn. And he said, quite frankly, if we don't repair it, you're going to die. That was pretty drastic. But he scheduled me for it, and I received open heart surgery, and and, uh, and I had a very hard time with it. I spent 12, 12 days before I actually came out of it and woke up. I spent 27 days in the hospital. Normally, open heart surgery, you're in there three to five days, you're back home again. But I've never done anything the easy way. So I didn't do that the easy way either. <clears throat> maybe that's what, maybe that's the reason the subject that I have on my mind this morning is there. I don't know. Uh, the subject that I have on my mind is the heart. And before I get into the scripture, I want to mention something that took place that I know I'll never forget as long as I live. But during some of my worst times, and I had some bad ones, because as the morphine wore off and I get, went, went through withdrawals, and you know that it happened, it happened, I experienced some, some of the worst times of my life because Every bad thing that ever happened to me for the 22 years I spent in the the naval service crossed through my mind during that period of time. Nothing good was ever in my visions and dreams, but all the bad things just kept rolling through my mind. But beginning there, in that hospital, after that surgery, and after I had woken up, my wife sat by my side almost continually. And every time I opened my, my, my eyes and looked at her, almost every time, she would squeeze my hand and say, you have a good heart. You have a good heart. You have a good heart. I don't think she knew until a long time after that how much that meant to me. To be reminded, to be reminded that I have a good heart. Because as I went into the surgery, I was on my way out of this world. And had not that taken place for me, that God blessed those surgeons to do, and I know it's because of His blessings giving them the talent to do that. Otherwise, it could not have been done. And then after they did what they did, if it had not been for God blessing me, I would have still gone out of this world. But God blessed me to survive, and so I live. I live because of that which was done on the inside of me. But I want to tell you this. As they did what was necessary for me to live, they broke into my heart, into my, into my body. <laughs> and you can see the scars now where they invaded my body and snatched out my heart and worked on it and put it back in. And the scars are still there on the outside. But I live because of my heart that's in good shape. Now, you look at me, you can't tell that that took place with me. Because I look the same pretty much as I did before that. I've lost a little hair. Although I've got a good heart and it works fine. My Bible has gotten bigger because my eyesight has gotten worse. And other things are taking place and I can see the changes day by day as I live 
but my heart is good and my heart is pumping uh, the blood through my veins in my body and the life is in the blood, but if the heart, if the power is not there uh, to provide uh, that life where it's needed within that body, the body will die. The heart is necessary. It is essential. I'm going to begin in the first book of John in chapter 3. Starting verse 18, he says, My little children, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, charity. Love in action. Love that is manifested outwardly because of that which is done inwardly. Love that we have because God first loved us. Love. We are to love. Not in word or not in tongue. In other words, we're not just to go around talking about how much we love everybody. But we are to manifest our love by doing those things that show those for whom we have love that we have it. My wife and I just passed our 50th anniversary. I doubt very seriously if she would have hung around with me that long. If from the time that she and I were brought together in marriage, I had never ever shown anything to manifest to her that I indeed loved her. I couldn't have expected her to hang around. People that get married, people that join themselves together are, are joined together. They need to take that into consideration. If they're going to get anything out of their marriage at all, anything out of their relationship, they've got to manifest what they feel for one another. Somehow they've got to manifest it. So it is with the child of God, especially as we come together in fellowship in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to manifest outwardly how we feel toward one another. We are to express it. And doing that is a good thing. Doing that is a good thing. Because he says in verse 19, and hereby we know and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him, God. Assure our heart. Our heart. Our heart needs strengthening by the assurance that we find in the fellowship among brothers and sisters of like faith and order. It is an assurance to us that we are God's children. For there's only one way that we can know that we have passed from death unto life, and that is that we love, we love the brethren. We love the brethren. Verse 20, now this sounds strange. And this is basically coming toward what I have on my mind for a subject. For if our heart condemn us, for if our heart condemn us, can that happen? Can that take place? It must be possible, otherwise John wouldn't have put it in here. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And that's important for us to hang on to. 
If our heart condemn us, that doesn't mean that we are condemned before God. But I'm going to tell you something, and I'll show you here in a moment why I'm telling you this. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Sometimes we walk under the condemnation unnecessarily before because we feel condemned before God. Why? Why do we feel that way? There's a good reason for it. But let us continue on here. He says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. If our heart condemn us not, we have confidence toward God. And I'm here to tell you that intermingling among brothers and sisters in Christ will maintain within, with us a, an atmosphere of assurance of our standing before God that we are His children. And we'll continue to have that confidence toward Him. Not confidence in ourselves, but confidence toward Him. Now, <clears throat> let's come back over here to the book of Romans for a moment. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7. Now, I believe you know and understand that you live lives now different than you once did. I believe you, you all would admit that. You live lives now different than the lives you once did. And I don't, I don't know how far you can go back with your mind in delving into this. It's hard for some of God's people to go back far enough to see that real contrast, contrast because some of God's children are like John the Baptist. They were quickened even while they were in their mother's womb. And our, our, our finite mind can't go back that far. So we have to understand what we were by nature and what we must be by the power of God through the, uh, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit unto that shed blood, we have to, we have to be able to grasp it with the intellectual, uh, with, with our intellectual ability in our mind. It's hard to do sometimes. But there are some that are like the Apostle Paul. Things happen in his life that brought about drastic changes and he could forevermore, while he lived here, could, could go back to that moment in time when he went from here to there. And it was a great contrast in his life. But whether we were quickened before we were ever ushered forth from the womb, or whether it was when we were 80 years old, or whatever time it was on this earth, it was according to God's own time and according to His good pleasure that He, through the power of the Holy Spirit, quickened you and made you alive in Christ Jesus and you became His child. Now the Apostle Paul said, <clears throat> he said he was alive one time without the law. But when the commandment came, he died. Let's read what he said. Starting at verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I don't believe he was talking about the letter of the law, which he lived up until the time that Jesus met him on the way to Damascus. He knew 
the Old Testament Scriptures. He lived by them and he thought he had something. He thought he had a righteousness before God, but he didn't. He didn't. But there came a time that there was a change that took place in him. And there was a law within him that he did not have to go and sit under the foot of the Sanhedrin to uh, learn and understand. There was a law that was written in his heart and on his mind. God came to him in that commandment. And from that time forward, dear children of God, he knew something that he did not know before. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died in the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Where, wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid! But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. You see, God's law, His law is spiritual, and it is made for the spiritual person. And God's people are spiritual people. Go with me, if you will, over the book of <clears throat> Galatians for a moment. Still <clears throat> delving into what the Apostle Paul said. You see, Paul now truly understood what transgression is. Now, in 1 John chapter 3, I think it's verse 2, it tells us that transgression, that sin is the transgression of the law. He didn't really understand that until his experience on the way to Damascus. But when Jesus entered into his life as it did into your life, Jesus who became part of your life, when he took up his abode in you by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's what the scripture says. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That and everything that comes with it including faith. Faith. Who Jesus is the author and finisher of all. If you didn't get it through Jesus Christ, you don't have it. If you have faith, if you have faith, it's not going to lead you to become a child of God. You have faith because you are a child of God and it's one of the evidences that you are. It's an evidence that you are a child of God. Now, <clears throat> Paul talks about, he talks about the life that he lived after that took place. Verse 20 in the Galatian letter, chapter 2, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Our life is hid in God with Christ. Our life in Christ can't be seen by this natural world. They look at you, they can't tell whether you have faith or not. They can't tell whether anything takes place on the inside of you or not. You look the same to you look to, you look the same to other people as you always did. So did the Apostle Paul. After that experience on the way to Damascus, the Apostle Paul had changed forever from the inside. He was never the same, even though he looked the same. 
He looked the same. Other than a few, few hairs missing and a few extra pounds and some sagging jaws and a few other rough spots on this old body, I still look the same. People still recognize me. When I go around, people I haven't seen for a long time. They, they still recognize me. I look the same. But I'm different. I'm different than I was before Christ did for me. Or God did for me through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that I could not do for myself. I could not do for myself. He did it for me. <laughs> he performed surgery on me. Now, that open heart surgery five years ago, I could told you. <laughs> they told, tore me apart on the way in and on the way out. They patched it up the best they could, but you can still see the evidence where they went in and where they come out. But you know the surgery that took place on the inside of me that, that God performed you see nothing on the outside. Nothing on the outside. He did his work on the inside. Now, if there's anything manifested on the outside, it's something that I do, but it doesn't bring me life. I've already got life. And that which I do to make the difference on the outside is done from the standpoint of that which God has done on the inside. You know, that's one of the hardest things for people to understand. I, I don't see why it is, but, but it, evidently it is because you try to explain that to some folks. And, and they just don't get it. it maybe, maybe what Paul said in a couple of verses back from verse 20, he says, uh, In verse 18 says, For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law and did to the law that I might live unto God. Now you think about that. Most of the times when we're trying to explain things like this, you're talking to people that have got their whole lives built up around some kind of a system that they have confidence in that's going to take them somewhere because it has made them something and they're relying on that. Now, Paul says if he goes back and builds those things again, it, it's a transgression. What is a transgression? It's a sin against God. So it is with us. If God has blessed us and brought us out of darkness into the marvelous light of a Savior's love, and then we go back. We go back to rebuild those things that we had left behind. What good is it to us? What good will come of it? It's not going to please God. Not in the least. You know when the when Israel was delivered out of out of Egypt, throughout their wanderings, they murmured and complained and, and carried on because of the harshness of the way. Even the manna that God had given them from on high, the, the heavenly bread that God gave them, and at one point they called it light bread. Light bread. First time as far as I know the word fresh and light bread has ever been used. It's in the book of Numbers. In the scripture, light bread. It wasn't heavy. They wanted some meat. Potatoes and all those things. Heavy, something that'll, that'll lay heavy on your stomach. They wanted something to, that they could feel was tangible. God's Manna from on high. It's light bread. It doesn't weigh us down. 
But it lifts us up. It gives us a buoyancy. It gives us a lightness in our step. That's what this heavenly manna will do for us. But you know, once the change has taken place in our lives, we still have these old earthen bodies. Paul says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And that's where our problem is. We still have these old earthen vessels and we want to polish them up, brighten them up, and decorate them and all this kind of stuff. When really, that which is important is on the inside. It's on the inside. And we, and we need to learn how to manifest that which is on the inside to the outside. Now we need, we have to learn to do that. And here's our textbook. Tells us all about it. There's an armor prepared for us that we clothe ourselves in. The whole armor of God. That will fight off the fiery darts of Satan. And all of those things. You know what I'm talking about. Now. <clears throat> I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's your new life. That's your new life. You know, the Apostle Paul, from the time of, of the intervention in his life by Christ on the way to Damascus, he was changed forever. He didn't do the same things that he once did. As a matter of fact, he tells us <clears throat> that although everything to him is lawful or legal, if you please, everything was not expedient for him to do because he says, I'll not be bound by any. And he says that some things do not edify. Now what is he telling us? That in this new life that we live, in this new life that we live, we need to be discriminating as to what we do, as to what we seek for as experiences. For one thing, we don't want to be bound. Now, let's put that in plain English. Do you want to be addicted to drugs, alcohol, or any other thing that will draw you off according to the lust of the flesh? These are, you know, there are many things we can become addicted to. You can become addicted to power. You can become addicted to popularity. You can become addicted to many things, but Paul in the Roman letter, he spoke of some, some of God's people. He said they had addicted themselves to the Word of God. It had become an addiction with them. So addiction is not bad as long as it's an addiction for the right thing. But those things that do not edify, those things that bind you to this world and the things of this world that do not bring honor and glory to God, those things, dear children of God, should be anathema to us and we should not let it be binding to us that we might freely worship God in spirit and in truth to edification, that is the building of ourselves up unto the Lord that we might always bring praise and honor and glory to Him in our life. Now, I don't want to leave this without mentioning what Paul also said in verse 21 in Galatians chapter 2. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Some of God's children do that. They frustrate the grace of God by mixing all kinds of things with it. I'm born of the Spirit of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, but you know, I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. Therefore, uh, I have this life that I have. 
You know, it's by the grace of God, but I, I've done this and I've done that. But if I had not done this and so and so had not done that, I, I wouldn't have been born of the Spirit of God. You're born of the Spirit of God because God is your heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father. Do you get that? You were born of a father and a mother. You didn't ask to be born. As you were a child, growing, developing, experimenting, your environment, you learned you had a mother and a father. But you learning that you had a mother and father didn't give them to you. Learning that God is your heavenly father didn't give you him either. You learned that God is your heavenly father because he is your heavenly father. To me that's plain and simple. <clears throat> now, let's speak about the law for a little bit. <clears throat> the law was added. Now, the law was added. And, and over in uh, chapter 3 of the book of Galatians, it tells you that in the 17th verse, Referring to, to Abraham, and we know that Abraham pleased God. We know that Abraham, uh, when he was called out of Ur of Chaldees, he went by faith. In other words, when he came out of Ur of Chaldees, he had faith. And he walked by faith. It tells you that in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. He had faith, and in the 15th chapter of the book of, of Genesis, God made a covenant with him. And then it tells us in this Galatian letter, chapter 17, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. The promise that God made and confirmed by a covenant to Abraham. The law did not touch it. That was all done outside of the context of the law. So don't ever get to thinking that you can obey the law and through obeying the law make yourself righteous before God that He will look favorably upon you. It does not work that way. <clears throat> now the law was added as you come on down you'll see where the law was added because of transgression we need to know and understand that God had a people before the law ever came into being the law which he gave them on Mount Sinai was given because of transgression and it was given for them to build their lives around it. The law never took away one sin but it just reminded them of their sin and that they were sinners before God and the law and the prophets were a continual promise to them of the coming of the Messiah and when John the Baptist came on the scene it says that the law, that, that all of the, the, the law and all of the prophets were until John since that time, the kingdom of heaven has been preached and men presseth into it. You have to put the law into perspective as to what it's for. Now we go over to, uh, again, backing over to the book of Romans. This time in chapter 5, if you will. <clears throat> That's where it tells us in verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so, uh, so death passed upon all men, 
For that all have sinned, for until the law, now notice this carefully, for until the law, sin was in the world. You see, before the law was given on Mount Sinai, sin was in the world because there was transgression against God. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So when the law came, sin was imputed unto them or laid to their account, and they had to deal with it from then on. But I want you to phone to point out to you when they began to deal with it. Not until after God had delivered them out of bondage did He give them that law, and from that point forward, they dealt with it. And I want to tell you, dear children of God, in like manner, when God delivered you from death, hell, and the grave, when He separated you unto Himself through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, made you light before Him, dear children of God, doing something for you that you could not do for yourselves. He made a difference in your life and that difference persists even until now. And you got to deal with it. That's the reason. That's the reason that our heart sometimes will condemn us. Why? Because the law of God is written in our heart and in our mind. We've got to deal with it. And when we do things that are against God, and transgress against Him, we have to deal with it, and we feel condemned before Him. That same law, dear children of God, that is the schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, sometimes we feel condemned and far from Him, but on the other hand, we come around the corner, we hear the preaching of the gospel, or we have the Lord blesses us to be lifted up again, and we see that we have a Redeemer, that He has died for me on Calvary's cross, and I come out of those doldrums, and I no longer feel condemned. But you see, the law written in our heart and on our minds is just like faith. It's an evidence to you that you are a child of God. God says that He chastiseth every son that He receiveth. That includes women as well. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the Son in you that He receives. He does not receive you as a person unto yourself. But He receives you unto Himself because He receives the Son that is in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he chastises every son that he received. <laughs> now, the writer in 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews says, if you are without chastisement, you are a bastard and not a son. You don't belong to the Father. I've known people that tell me that they don't feel chastisement from God. I don't argue with them about that. I go on about my business. That's something they got to deal with. Not me. I am chastised. I have chastisement from God on a continual basis. I assure you. Things don't always go right with me. Not in my physical life, natural life, nor in my spiritual life. Things do not always go exactly right. But I'm thankful to God that between on either side of every valley, there's a mountain. And as I go through the valley, I know that I've come down off of a mountain on that side and I'm going to climb a mountain on the other side as I continue journeying in this life. And time don't stand still. It continues to move on. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, <laughs> Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was 
to come. There are a lot of ways I'd like to preach an hour on that, just as Adam is a figure of Christ, but we won't get into it. You probably heard it preached before anyway, and you probably understood it, maybe even better than I. <clears throat> but there are aspects in which Adam is a figure of Christ. Now, Peter says in Second Peter chapter two verse eight, he proves to us that God had had a people before the law ever came into existence. Because Peter said <clears throat> that Lot was a just man. That's in verse seven. But in verse 8 he said that when God came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah he destroyed a place where Lot had lived for a number of years. Now Lot chose to live there but after he got down there we find that their unlawful ways vexed vexed Lot's righteous soul. God's people under the old covenant and even before the law was given they were vexed because of the things done around them that were unlawful to them. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter 6 where Moses uh, where Noah in, in the time of Noah, the sons of God, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they chose for themselves wives, plural. They chose for themselves multiple wives according to how they looked to the natural vision. You know, that's one of, that's one of the biggest problems today among our young people. They normally choose who they are to spend the rest of their lives with in that fashion and they don't get to spend the rest of their lives with those that they have chosen. It unravels, it comes apart. But in those circumstances, God looked down upon that scene and the Scriptures tell you that God saw Noah righteous before him. The only way that Noah could be righteous is before God. There was no righteousness in Noah. There is no righteousness in any of us. If God does not see us righteous before him, we'll never attain unto any righteousness. There is no righteousness in us. There was none in Noah. But God saw Noah righteous before him and because of the righteousness of Noah, as he looked upon him, he saved Noah and his family by flood. In other words, he separated Noah from that which was vexing him and his household in that day. He separated him unto himself that he might serve him the same way that he separated the Israel out of Egypt. What did what did uh, Moses say to Pharaoh? Let my people go. He's re re reporting to him what God said. Let my people go that they might go three days in the wilderness and serve me. And in another place that they might uh, make an offering unto me. And again, that they might sacrifice unto me. He separated them for that purpose. He separated you from darkness unto the marvelous light of a Savior's love that you might serve Him. That you might walk before Him. That's the reason Jesus says, Ye are the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world. There is no light in this dark world other than the light that shines forth from the children of God. Let us not hide it, but let us bring it together 
And the more we come together, the more people that come together in sweet fellowship and love, the brighter that light shines. And it gives a brightness that can be seen from outside. And Jesus says that can see it and glorify God. And glorify God. But God said that that the imagination of the heart of man was wicked continually. And then we come over into <clears throat> uh, David. And then we'll find what David says about himself. Psalm 51 verse 5, he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Even at the moment of conception. That's why you're still in the, in, inside of the mother. Even at the moment of conception, you're in sin. You're, you're not going to get out of it. You're not going to avoid it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none, none good, no, not one. You cannot, cannot get away from that. <clears throat> he says in uh, Psalm 58 and 3, that the wicked are estranged from the, from, from the womb, and they go forth speaking lies. So, so, in the very beginning there, they're that way. But yet, David says, he knew this also, he says in verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. In Matthew, in uh, Jeremiah chapter uh, 24, in verse 7, he says, And I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Now you might not do it while you live here in this life, but I'll guarantee you on the day of the resurrection, you will return unto him with your whole heart. You will be complete. There will be nothing missing. You're complete in him now as God looks upon you. You're complete in him. But you'll never be complete before Him in the way that you're going to be complete with Him in immortal glory. You will be complete there and you will be there with your whole heart. In the book of uh, <clears throat> Jeremiah, going on over to uh, chapter 32, verse 39 and 41, he, uh, through 41, he says, And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and for the children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them and I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will, but I will put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. God has a heart. God has a soul. It says so right there. And he says that David was a man after his own heart. I believe that all of God's children are after his own heart because he prepared for them with his whole heart and with his whole soul, he cares for you. He will never forsake you. And you will live with him in heaven and immortal glory. So I tell you this morning, dear children of God, you have a good heart. God has given you a good heart. Take that good heart, dear children of God, and use all of the strength of it to the honor and glory of God. May God bless and keep you. Is my prayer for Christ. Amen.